I'm Hendrik. Um, I live in Berlin. I'm a uh, game engineer there. I worked for seven years in the games industry for various companies, uh, including three years at Buga, which was a lot of fun, met a lot of great people. Nowadays, I'm freelance, and that means that uh, I can express whatever opinion I want to. It's all my own opinions. And one strong opinion that I have is I absolutely love randomness. Why is that? Well, I'll start with something completely different, which is the concept of suspense. Now, this word was coined by Alfred Hitchcock, the filmmaker, and he says, I'm going to tell you that something is going to happen, but until it happens, you don't know what it is. Right? And this suspense, this keeps you on edge until it is relieved. And our brains, as it turns out, absolutely love this. Right? So what does that have to do with games? Well, here's an example. You're playing a game of poker. That's you, that's your opponent. It's standoff. Everything is riding on this. This is the last game. All right, so you draw some cards, right? I mean, okay, not very conclusive. You draw another card. Well, you have a chance to draw another heart here, but your opponent has, has three sixes. Now, you know the odds. You can calculate this in your mind, but deep down, you don't know what it's going to be until that last card is flipped, right? So you're in suspense. And this is the feeling that I want to talk about. This is less a talk about what randomness is, but more how randomness feels like. So why talk about games? Actually, we've used randomness in games since before recorded history. And there is a deep connection there to fortune telling, thinking about the future, the concept of fate. But also, as social animals, there is this concept of fairness, that someone else doesn't get more than I do. And that has a lot to do with this concept of arbitrary fate, right? Also, I think it's really cool that 2,000 years ago, some Greek philosopher played D&D &D and rolled a crit on that die. Um, now, you notice that this die um, has uh, Greek letters on it, uh, as opposed to our more common numbers these days. Well, we make video games, so we should probably talk about random numbers here a little bit. What are random numbers? It's a sequence of numbers. They're independent from each other and hopefully independent from outside influences. Now, in your favorite programming language, that looks kind of like this. Uh, you have a function, you pass in an interval, lower bound, higher bound, something like that. In there is some magic, right? Maybe an algorithm, like pseudorandom. Maybe it's some lava lamps in an office somewhere, right? Maybe it's some cesium decaying into a Geiger counter connected to the internet in a lab in Switzerland. You don't know. It's magic, but it works. So let's make a game with that, right? Here's one, Settlers of Catan. That's a board game. It's been out for a while. You might know it. This is a Euro-style board game, and that means that the influence of luck is limited. But that is what we're here to talk about, so let's talk about that. Now, luck in this game works like this. You have these 2d6, two six-sided dice. You add the result, and that's affecting the game significantly. And what you should know is that if a seven is rolled, bad things happen, right? Well, that's not hard. We can make that. Roll random from one to six, add another random from one to six. Easy. Ship it. Done. And then this happens. This is a review from the Steam version of the game. And someone complains that the dice rolled the number five seven times in a row and that they suspect that the AI is cheating. All right, let's, let's look at the distribution, right? 2d6, that should look something like this. This is normalized down to 60, 60 dice rolls. Uh, usual game has 60 to 100, depending on modifications. And you see this, this triangular shape, right? So seven is the most likely outcome, one out of six, and then the other ones fall like this. And then if you play a game, maybe it looks like this. This is a game I played, right? Group looks reasonable. Um, and then you play another game, and you see, wow, like the seven was supposed to come up 10 times in this game, but only came up three times. There's a massive outlier here. And then you get some reviews from your players, and they say like, no, this, this can't be, and uh, I start to look for patterns in your random numbers, and they want to see the code for your random number generator, and you should use radioactivity, because like real dice don't roll 10, seven, six times in a row, like that can't be. Um, yeah. <laughs> What's going on? Humans are very irrational, right? We're subject to a lot of cognitive biases. We tend to see patterns everywhere, even when there are no patterns there, right? 
And these, like, this leads to things like, uh, for example, if you throw darts at a wall and just look at it, you'll spot clusters in there, even though it's completely random. That's called the clustering illusion. Or every gambler will tell you that they have a feeling, an intuition about a die you know, being hot or being, being up, coming up soon, right? But there's something else going on here as well. We're making video games. A pair of dice is pretty stupid, right? You can't argue with that. I mean, I've seen people do it, but you know, it's, they're really dumb. But a phone is amazing. A computer can do all these amazing things these days, right? It has agency. It can act on its own. So we're much more likely, I think, to suspect it of being able to cheat of having agency against us, especially if, in the, like in the Settlers of Catan, we give that computer a face, a human face, right? Well, what can we do? I would say let's double down on that. Let's make random less random, right? I mean, people think that it's not random anyway, so why make it random? So this is the almost 10 years old version of the Settlers of Catan for mobile. Uh, I worked on that game. That was a lot of fun, great team. And you can see here, you can select the, the dice mode. And you can select the mode called stack. Now what does that do? Well, it's not hard. You take every possible result from your random variable, from your random input. You write all of them down on cards, put all the cards into a stack, shuffle that stack, and then when you want to roll 2d6, you just draw a card from the stack. When you're out, like when the stack is empty, you just reshuffle. Now, what does that do? It's just an example, but here you can see how the distribution changes. Now, OK, I mean, it's random. It's just one example. But you can already feel how much closer this is to the expected distribution. And that makes a lot of sense if you think about it. Like, if you have a card stack, and you're looking for an ace of clubs. You have to draw that and then go through the whole stack and reshuffle before it can come up again. This is a terrible random number generator. These numbers are no longer independent from each other, not at all. We know now that a die roll will come up, just not when, right? Suspense. Beware that if you do something like that, this opens you up to card counting attacks. And also, I've seen reviews of that game where people suspect that the randomness used to shuffle is not random enough, and they want to see the algorithm for shuffling that, right? Cool. Remember how in Catan, seven means bad things? Yeah, these bad things have a face, a pretty ugly face, right? And in user tests, we, we, we noticed that uh, players complain a lot about this happening, and this happening out of order, right? Not enough or too often. So, for example, could we control just for this high impact event without affecting the rest of the game? So this is a bit hypothetical, but here's what you could do. You could, for example, use a card stack to control whether a seven was rolled or not. And if you decided that it was not rolled, you roll 2d6 and discard seven as a possible outcome, right? So what does that change? Here's an example. This is the distribution. You can see that the seven comes up exactly 10 times, right? Whereas the other numbers look like the dice, right? Pretty, pretty much unchanged. So what you can do is you use decision trees to combine multiple random processes. And you've probably already done something like this. So if you ever programmed a loot system, it probably looks something like this. You first select the category, and then from that category, you draw the random loot. But the important thing is, you could use two different random processes in each of these steps. For example, you could use a card stack to determine whether epic loot was rolled or not, right? So that looks something like this. If it's a chance of 2%, you have a stack, and it's 50 entries, like 50 cards, and one of them says yes, and the other say no. That seems a bit unwieldy. So briefly, I'll, I'll show you something different, which is uh, progressive randomness. It's a very, very old technique, at least as old as Warcraft 3. And the idea is you roll against percentage, and when you fail, you increase the percentage. Right? For example, 2%, and you increase it by steps of 2%, and then you know after 50 times the chance is 100%. And that makes it a lot easier to reason about your game, because you know that after 50 tries, your player will have dropped that epic loot. Right? 
This is quite common for loot boxes. Since we're on the subject of loot boxes, I have a theory here. A box is a kind of impersonal thing. It doesn't have a face. It doesn't have agency. And I suspect deeply that players are must, much less likely to think that the box is cheating them as opposed to if it's a monster that drops that loot or if it's a trader that gives you that reward. Right? Okay, I talked a lot about shuffling. Let's go a little bit beyond shuffling. Recently, I was contacted by a company and they said, hey, we want to generate a lot of levels, like a thousand or something like that, right? All right, cool. Um, what do you guys have? Well, we have five art sets, like these, and 17 animal characters. And we want to generate levels, and they shouldn't repeat too much. Ooh, five and 17, those are prime numbers. Uh, I, you know, the, the, the math side inside of me like, gets all, all interested. So, OK, I mean, we don't have much time. First idea, let's generate all the combinations and shuffle them around, right? Shuffling is great. And then you end up with this, like a polar bear in the desert. Uh, and, and like this, this feels too random. This, this doesn't feel good. So your designer comes up with some sort of ideas of, like, let's set up dependencies. And in this art set, only these animals come up. And this actually looks a lot like a, dependent, uh, a decision tree that we had earlier, right? OK, so we have set that up. Cool, nice. Um, but this is getting a bit complicated. Now we only want to generate combinations where these dependencies are satisfied. And as it turns out, there's a lot more parameters to the levels, right? Buildings and modifiers and a lot of stuff. And the problem space just becomes way too large to generate all the possibilities. More worryingly, we still might get three levels in a row with the same animal, right? And, and that feels way too random. That just doesn't feel right. Why does this not feel right? What are we trying to do here, actually? We're trying not to repeat too much. What does that mean? It should feel designed. It should not feel too random. Right? There should not be clusters in there. So the first thing we should do probably is break up these clusters. How do you do that? Well, you come up with constraints. Right? Your designer helps you with that, and they say, like, your th the theme should only repeat at most every four levels, and the animals should only repeat every 10 levels, and then there's a lot more constraints in there. Cool. And then you look at that and you get an idea. Can we pick a random level that satisfies these constraints? OK, we finally have to talk about random numbers here. Um, so I have an exercise for you. You have a phone, like a smartphone, and you want to generate random numbers. But you don't have internet. And you don't have any cool dice rolling apps on there. What can you do? If you have a good idea, approach me afterwards. Um, here is, sorry, uh, here is my like, textbook solution. You open the calculator, you punch in a bunch of numbers. Those are not very random, let's be honest. But then you press the square root button. And the last digits you get there are pretty random. And then you press the square root button again, and you get more randomness and more randomness. And that's actually how algorithmic random number generators work. You pass in a first value, the seed value, and then you progressively uh, apply some algorithm to it. And that gives you the next step, like the next seed, but also the result out there. Is there a better algorithm than square root? Um, actually, square root is not that bad. The Manhattan Project used square root with some modifications to generate its random numbers for the Monte Carlo sim simulations back then. So I guess it's not too bad. But yeah, there is better stuff. Uh, this is, the, as far as I know, like state of the art that's used a lot, XOR shift. So you XOR and shift some bits around using three prime numbers. So this must be very good. And it's really, really fast. So that's cool. And we use that to generate our levels. Here, that's how that looks. You pass in a seed value, you take a random number, you shuffle it around, you pick the theme based on that random number, then for that theme, uh, you walk down the decision tree to pick the correct animal there, so you satisfy the dependency, you only generate levels which satisfy these dependencies, and then you can easily just return a level for a seed value here. And then given existing levels, you generate a lot of levels until you find one where the constraints are met. And that's what we did. Given a number of levels, find a seat for the next level where all the constraints are met. And this is so fast, you can just crunch through a lot of seats, basically the integer space. You just go through it, right? And that leaves you with offline generated content where every level is just a single integer. So it's really fast, it's really small, right? 
all the dependencies are solved. You know polar bears in the desert. The constraints are solved. It is tiny on disk and it's really fast at runtime. Like, that's cool, but the main takeaway is this thing, right? If you have a sequence, you generate a lot of candidates, and you pick a candidate that, fix, uh, that, that, that satisfies your constraints. This is very, very flexible, flexible very versatile, right? For example, in the Settlers of Catan, we could say, uh, if a player wrote the same value the last round, discard it, pick another one. Uh, in a loot box game, we could force an epic box after 20 non-epic boxes. In a match three game, if the gems that trickled in are not interesting, discard, trickle other gems, right? This, this, this concept is very, very flexible, very powerful. Of course, it's terribly inefficient, but that's, is that such a problem these days anymore? Well, it's time to wrap up. Um, I hope I introduced you a little bit to this concept that I like to call modern randomness, which is much, much more sophisticated these days than just rolling a single value. Right? You can optimize randomness towards a goal, usually probably a revenue, depending on which game you're doing. You can do that in an, in an analytics-driven way. Your, your data scientist is not interested in extreme outliers, like 0.1% of players that don't get epic loot, and 0.01% .01 that always get the epic loot. Like, that, that, that outliers don't help you in reasoning about your game. We have so much computer, uh, compute power these days. The flip side of this is one of trust. Are loot boxes really random? Are random encounters really random? Does my match three game just give me bad colors on purpose? Frustration, managing player frustration is a core discipline of game design and can be very desired. You're in a covenant with your players here. Be careful whether you want to break that. And depending on where you are, gambling laws might apply to you. So. Cool, key takeaways here. Real randomness doesn't feel random all the time. Uh, I showed you some techniques you can do to like, optimize things. Um, I hope you also take away that presentation matters a lot, especially when you put a human face on your random process. Like, game design and psychology and data science are really coming together. And the, game design, the, the, the games industry is, is at a very interesting point now, right? Where we shape randomness to where it's making more interesting, more satisfying, more fun games. That's it, thank you very much.